Um, I, um, I do want to um, uh, um, uh, share with you what I have, what I learned, uh, though um, um, I'm um, not really um, um, satisfied and I, um, I, I'm still uh, trying to find out more. Um, the, um, the problem I'm having is um, that um, the men who, who um, have um, um, these genital um, uh, difficulties um, as the, um, the Torah is explicit, um, um, they, they are not permitted these men um, are uh, not admitted lo yavo may not come into the kahal Hashem, into the congregation of the Lord. And the rabbis interpret this to mean they may not marry Jewish women because of their inability to father children. And therefore, they cannot um, uh, fulfill the commandment of fru or vu. And um, uh, this is explicit. And then we go and we read uh, in the Mishnah about um, these various um, uh, types, like for instance, the saris. Um, saris uh, is literally uh, a eunuch, one who, uh, again, cannot um, um, father uh, children. And we're talking about them getting married. Well, uh, they're not allowed to enter the community. So how can they get married? So that's, that's my problem. And um, so the, uh, the answer that I come up with is that um, they're not supposed to, but what happens if they do? Um, and... Um, the uh, Saris Chama, you'll remember um, uh, that um, the Mishnah distinguishes in this um, um, problematic um, um, tra two traditions which Rabbi Yoshua um, uh, brings uh, before the, um, the Beit Midrash, before the academy. And Rabbi Akiva answers, and um, and then Rabbi Eli Elazar says, "No, no, no, it's the opposite." But in the, in this case, we're talking about a, a suris chama and a suris adam. Suris chama um, is um, in understood to mean. Um, a, um, a man who was born that way, Hama, in the meaning of Shemesh, of son. Um, and the uh, Talmud Yerushalmi explains um, that the sun never shined on him when he was fully capable of fathering a child. Um, so how can such a person get married? Uh, uh, and uh, th the answer uh, uh, that I have come up with is, uh, well, they shouldn't, but the mission is talking about what happens if they did. Um, 
there are some who interpret uh, Hama uh, not that he was born that way, but that he was born normally, got married, and his uh, uh, genitals were damaged not by man, not in a fight or uh, by a human uh, act, but he got sick and, um, and it was an act of God. Um, but uh, um, I, I've done some more uh, research after I was told that and found, um, I think one reference that, but every other reference that I have found interprets the Suris Chama as being born that way. Um, and so I, I, um, I'm, I, I wish I could give you a, a, a better um, interpretation of, of, of this, but um, that's all I have come up with that uh, these uh, men, the marriage really shouldn't have taken place, uh, but, but it has. And um, the, the tradition, um, there are statements in the tradition that say um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, that we should be as flexible as possible in these matters, um, and, um, uh, and 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 uh, be as as lenient as as um, uh, so uh, uh, there is dispute among the authorities um, and. Uh, let me translate something that I found on, on the web. Um, in general, um, in these matters, decisors, in other words, uh, great rabbis who have given uh, halachic opinions or psak, posek, is to, is to, um, to deliver a, a, a decision. They're called Paskanim. Uh, not every rabbi reaches the point where his decisions are broadly recognized. These are um, uh, giants whose opinions are recorded and passed on and are um, a part of a, a tradition that goes from generation to generation people uh, looking to these authorities and, um, and um, um, following them or when there is some dispute, trying to figure out um, uh, why the dispute um, and um, um, why, what's, what's causing their, their disagreement, but following um, uh, the um, the path that earlier authorities have established. Uh, this is um, the nature of uh, orthodox uh, view of halacha, and it says, "Patsua daka uchrut shofcha raui lahakel velo lahachmir." It's appropriate to be lenient and not, not strict. Um, and you should go not go out of your way to be strict. Rather the opposite. Find ways to be lenient. And it is a great commandment to try to find a way to be lenient. 
Laval Yudhu Mikahal Hashem, that they not be excluded from which community. Kizehu in Yan shall kuach nefesh, for this is a matter of nefesh, of saving a life. Um, so, um, uh, Anyhow, uh, the um, uh, uh, best I can come up with is that um, uh, these men shouldn't have married to begin with unless the damage, they were married and then the damage occurred after they got married. Okay, any questions? Sorry, I couldn't be more um, um, uh, more uh, um, um, definitive, but that's his best so far. I, I haven't given up, but so far that's that's what I have found. Okay, um, we're going to go on skipping um, um, chapter nine. But uh, going on to chapter 10 and a, um, uh, another um, uh, subject. Oops, I have to stop the share. I'm sorry. Now we'll start again. Let's see if I can get it. Okay. okay. Nope. Okay, I'm going to get rid of it. Um, you see this? This is the first Mishnah in chapter 10. Yeah, we see um, it. Um, you, you do see it? Yes. Yes. Good. Uh, this is a case of a woman whose husband uh, uh went overseas. Um, the, the Hebrew is Shehalach Limdinat Hayam. He went to a city um, of, the, of the sea, of the Yam. In other words, um, the land of Israel is, of course, on the Mediterranean. And um, so we have a case of a man uh, who, who left the land of Israel and went on a trip. And on this, in this case, and people came and said to her, mate ba'alech, your husband is dead. V'niseit, so she remarried. V'acharkach ba'ala, and afterwards her husband returned. So now she's married married to two different men. It was not intentional, of course, but it happened. What happens? Teitze mize u mize. She can't be married to either husband. She goes out from both of them, meaning she has to divorce both of them. Utsricha get and both men have to give her a get. Not only that, she is not entitled to the um, payment of her ketubah, which is um, in the case of a divorce, uh, the uh, money that the um, divorcee gets from her husband. The low payrot. <clears throat> payrot refers to profits. Uh, pre literally means a fruit. And when you uh, have um, um, a... Uh, uh, um, 
either uh, uh, an investment or you have property and it um, and it provides an income and she um, had that when she was married she is entitled in the case of a divorce of regaining that money from her ex-husband he gets it while married but um, in this case, because of the situation, she loses that too. The loan is on oath, nor does she get um, the normal um, uh, uh, reward of uh, food, nor the laot. Blaot are worn clothes. Um, uh, that is the clothes that she brought into the marriage. Obviously, she she uh, she's not left with no clothes. But uh, this is um, uh, uh, a reference to um, extra property which she brought into the of both marriages lo alze below alze neither one neither husband has the obligation to return this um, uh, uh, property which she brought into the marriage im natla if she took these things Mize umize from either of the husbands, tachzir, she has to return everything. The havlad and any um, uh, in pregnancy from either husband after she remarried the the second. The second man is a mamzer. Is a, uh, a mamzer that is is an illegitimate child. Very, uh, very. Um, um, I can't think of <laughs> of anything uh, 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 that isn't uh, really very, very um, strict. Um, in um, one of the uh, things, I think we've referred to this before, but in, um, in um, American law, uh, and this was a real uh, problem in this, uh, as a result of uh, the world wars of the last century, in that uh, men who were missing in action um, uh, in American law, I believe it's seven years, and they are legally considered uh, uh, dead if uh, uh, there's no indication that they are alive. That doesn't happen in Jewish law. In Jewish law, uh, that woman is an aguna, uh, and she cannot get married. Um, this is a, a, a and, and, um, and that's permanent. There is no um, limitation. Um, uh, and, and you can see why if, if there is a mistake, this, and she does remarry, this is Junk really and Gmail. A, a, a terrible, terrible situation. Okay, questions. Karen. Basically, if, if if a woman's husband went abroad to he was a merchant and he died, she she could really in she could never remarry. That, I mean if witnesses come back and tell her that he is dead, she can, but if it turns out that um, these uh, um, 
these witnesses are mistaken and she does remarry, then we have this terrible situation. So, so shouldn't the punishment be on the witnesses, not on the... Absolutely. If, um, if they are proven to be a deem zoma me, uh, this is a, 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 um, a category of um, witnesses who, are, who give false testimony. Right. But, intentionally, um, intentionally intent false. Exactly. Okay. Um, um, that's something that um, is dealt with in, in the next Seder, in Seder Nazikin, which really um, uh, deals with um, court cases. Um, uh, the um, uh, the uh, the concern really of um, of the halacha is um, is really very um, very focused on uh, the woman having only one husband. Um, yes, Karen. So does the Talmud? I seem to remember that there was. Um, that we ended up with something where if, if a man is traveling, he gives her a um, provisional get before he leaves. Is that, is that how they resolve this? Yes. Okay. Yes, that is one way out of it, that before they went to war, uh, they, would, uh, uh, um, the, they would arrange a provisional get in the event that uh, he is missing in action, uh, then um, she can be uh, uh, divorced and remarried. That's one of the, one of the ways out of this um, uh, agony of, um, of uh, the woman being an aguna. It's a real, it's a real problem in Jewish law. I think I, I, I mentioned to you that um, at, at the seminary there were a couple women who were one was the switchboard operator. I think the other was in charge of the um, cafeteria, and these women were given jobs by the seminary because they were agunot. Uh, their husbands were. Uh, uh, soldiers in the Second World War and um, were um, missing in action and, um, um, and there was no proof of their death. And, um, and so I think, I, I mean, it didn't happen while I was there. I was a student only in the early 60s, but um, I was told that these women um, who were not married, uh, uh, had been married, and, um, and were agunot. Okay, so it, it's a terrible uh, uh, piece of, of our, uh, it's, a, it's a real problematic piece of, of Jewish law. Um, the, the Mishnah continues, below zeh bazeh mitam'im la. If the, either one of the husbands that she married was a Kohen, was a priest, neither one subjects himself to tum'ah, to being ritually impure if she dies before they do. Neither one of them is, um, is granted um, uh, any uh, benefit yadeha. Neither one uh, well, let me let me look a little bit at this uh, because our translation adds a, a little bit of uh, 
commentary with regard to the mamzer. Her child from the second husband is definitely a mamzer. She was still married to the first. She was never divorced. And the sages decreed that if she returned to her first husband while still married to the second husband, a child born later from him is also a mamzer. So that's uh, really um, 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 a, a, an addition that the, the uh, rabbis um, added. So the Mishnah continues, neither of the husbands may be become impure upon her death if they are, are priests. Um, uh, you know that Kohanim, uh, descendants of Aaron, uh, normally avoid uh, coming into any um, uh, place where there is a dead body. Um, it's not only the cemetery, but um, even um, in uh, hospitals, um, there are uh, signs in Israel um, at uh, Sha'arei Tzedek and probably Bikur Cholim, uh, uh, Orthodox hospitals, that, uh, uh, um, that if there is a death in the hospital, they put up a sign uh, warning uh, doctors who are Kohanim that there is a, a dead body in the building. Um, the, um, the tum'ah, the impurity, um, is, um, um, is very, um, uh, is the, the, the greatest, the highest level of impurity, and you don't even have to touch it. It's not, if you're in um, uh, the presence of a dead body, um, in the same uh, area, um, uh, there, the exception is of a close relative, a parent, a child, a wife, um, where the Kohen is permitted to, um, to attend the funeral and burial. The Mishnah then continues that that neither one gets the rights uh, of a normal husband. That is, if she finds something um, or if she earns something from property that she brought into the marriage, he also, neither one can nullify the, the, um, uh, the vows. Um, uh, lo behafarat nedareha. Neder is a vow. And you may recall at the end of the book of Numbers, uh, there is a section about um, a woman who takes a vow and, um, and a procedure for her husband to nullify those vows. A vow, as um, we have a whole tractate on vows uh, 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 and coming up in, in, in this say there, in fact, um, uh, that um, an, a vow, um, the, the rabbis, um, take very, very seriously um, uh, words and promises. This, of course, is the Kol Nidre. Uh, the famous Kol Nidre, Nidre is the plural, the Aramaic plural of Neder. Um, Kol Nidre, of course, is in Aramaic because it is an official um, uh, uh, document, one can say. 
That's why it's repeated three times um, uh, to, to give it force, to give it validity. If it's only said once, it's not valid. You have to do it three times. Um, Kol Nidre um, is a, um, was when it was introduced and it has been um, um, repeatedly a, a very problematic um, um, part of our tradition. Uh, I am uh, convinced that uh, the, um, the melody and the, um, the way we look upon it today is, um, uh, is the reason, is the major reason that we still have it. Originally, when it was first introduced, what it did was to cancel any vow which we made during the previous year to God. And we didn't fulfill it. We had promised an offering to the temple and we forgot about it. We didn't do it. We're now canceling it before Yom Kippur to gain God's forgiveness. The rabbis were terribly disturbed by this because you can't really do something ex post facto. It's over. You can't say, hey, I'm canceling what I didn't do that was in the past. And that's why the language was changed to say, me Kippurim Zeh. Ad Yom Kippurim Haba. We're canceling in advance any vows that we make in the coming year. Makes no sense. But uh, that was how it, it, the rabbis allowed it to continue. It's fascinating how uh, important people feel Kol Nidre is today and how um, uh, problematic the whole thing is if you know the words, what the words mean. And um, um, truth of the matter is that um, like the ketubah, the traditional ketubah used in a wedding, which is another contract in Aramaic, um, very, very few rabbis even can translate uh, um, uh, fluently. They can make sense out of it because if you, if you study Gemara, you got to know some Aramaic. You may not uh, have studied the language as the language, but you picked up um, enough that you can make sense of it. It's very rare that people really study Aramaic. In fact, it was many, many years ago, um, uh, there was a, a very uh, Haredi, uh, a, a, a ultra-Orthodox rabbi in Cleveland who asked if I would teach him Aramaic. Um, that um, was uh, the, the central uh, study of mine at, at, in graduate school. Um, and so I, I studied the uh, Syriac, which is Christian Aramaic, and it's uh, the closest that we have to Babylonian Aramaic. Um, and, uh, um, and one of the advantages of Syriac um, that we don't have in Babylonian Aramaic is that it has the vowels. Um, in Babylonian Aramaic, obviously the Talmud is written without vowels. And so, for instance, people say, Tanu Rabbanan. No, that's Hebrew 
vowels. Shanu, the, the third person plural in uh, verbs that end with a yud or a hey, um, like shana, is u, shanu. But in Aramaic, it's not tanu rabbanan, it's to know rabbanan. Instead of an u, it's an o. Uh, so if you go to yeshiva, you'll never hear anybody say to know Rabbanan. The only people who say to know Rabbanan are me and my students and my chavruta. <laughs> um, same thing with um, um, hash, uh, hashta. Hashta means to now. Now. It's really hasha'a. So the correct pronunciation of hashta is really hashata. The ayin originally, because in Babylonian Aramaic, in contrast to Palestinian Aramaic, they're two different dialects. Um, and um, in Babylonian Aramaic, because in Akkadian, which is the Semitic language that was spoken in Babylonia, the gutturals, ayin and het, were not pronounced correctly, just like we don't pronounce them. We pronounce ayin like we pronounce alim. So it was in Aramaic, in Babylonia. They didn't pronounce the ayin as it's supposed to be pronounced, which is like it's pronounced in Arabic. If you ever get a chance to hear a Yemenite read Torah, you will hear the ayin pronounced like it is in Arabic. You have to make a distinction between an aleph and an ayin. And in fact, in Arabic, there's even a chayin, which sounds differently from ayin. So for instance, the, uh, the place that we call Gaza, Gaza is in Hebrew, Adza, ayin, because it really is a chayin, chayin. So uh, when um, uh, the um, Septuagint, the Greek uh, translation was made for Gaza, they wrote a G, Gaza. But it's really, if you read it in, 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 in Hebrew, it's an ayin. But originally, it was a Gaza. That's another sound that's not even in Hebrew. So there are sounds in, in um, differences. For instance, in, um, in, we pronounce a tet and a taf the same. No, they're different. They're different in Arabic. And Jews who come from Arab countries, Arab-speaking countries, make a distinction between tet, uh, taf, Half a regular T and tet, tet. It's stronger. It's an emphatic T. Um, and so um, Aleph and Ayin are separate. They're not the same. And if we pronounce them correctly, we would have much less problem spelling Hebrew. But, but we don't. Same thing with het. And half. I remember well um, our, our second daughter who lives here with us, Deborah, when she was um, in Israel in the fourth grade when we were living there for the year. Um, and she wrote the word now, achshav, as aleph, chet, shin, bet. Bet, achshav. It's achshav. Yes, it sounded like achshav. The only problem is that it's three 
of the letters are wrong. It's ayin, kaf, shin, vav. Um, we don't distinguish between vav and bet. But if you hear a, um, a Yemenite, he, will, he would distinguish between bet and vet. Bet and vav. Vav is more w, w, dawid. It's not David. David's name in in correct Hebrew is David. David. V, v, but you see, in German, German doesn't have a v. It has only a w. And so, um, um, uh, again, vait and vav are different. They're not the same. We pronounce them the same, but that's our our um, our problem. Uh, and um, uh, and many of the same problems that we have, you have in Babylonian um, uh, Aramaic. Again, for the same reason that in the language that was spoken, those sounds don't exist. And so people can't pronounce them. Um, and, um, and so, for instance, in, in the Talmud, uh, the prefix Aleph before a noun is Al. An, but Al is spelled with an ayin. But in Babylonian Aramaic, you'll see an Aleph. Um, and um, again, um, in yeshivas, uh, they will know that the Aleph means An, but to tell them that that's really because in, in Babylonia, they didn't pronounce Aleph they didn't pronounce I incorrectly, and that's why it's an Aleph. They don't teach that in the yeshiva. Um, one of my, um, one of the um, advantages that I had um, studying Talmud was uh, that um, I, I already had been studying Aramaic as an undergraduate. And so, um, uh, when I, in fact, the first serious Talmud that I had was at the Hebrew University, and uh, my teacher there was uh, Professor Rosenthal, and uh, he, in his teaching Talmud at the university, he taught basic Aramaic, and um, and I relied on that, and when I came to the seminary. Um, um, I excelled in Talmud, not because I have a, had or have now a great background in Talmud, but because of my knowledge of Aramaic, it was, um, it was uh, easier for me to handle the text. Um, Rabbi? Yes. Do, do you know any Chaldeans? I'm just wondering if you can converse with them. <laughs> I, I don't speak Aramaic. Um, and um, in, in one of my uh, classes at Yale, uh, we did um, uh, read some um, modern Aramaic. Um, there, there were, I'm not sure if there still are, but there were at least in the last century, um, a couple villages in Lebanon that were really isolated in the mountains. And they continued to speak Aramaic. Um, and uh, there was a German uh, professor by the name of Nuldeke who went to these villages and wrote down what he heard. There's no written contemporary literature um, that he had, but um, um, he 
he uh, notated uh, what he heard, and we read those texts. As far as I was concerned, while there was some Aramaic there, there was much more Arabic and Turkish than there was Aramaic. Uh, yes, there was Aramaic, but not very much. And um, so I don't speak Aramaic, but I can tell you that a, a fellow student at Yale who became a, a major authority in um, the Aramaic of the Kurdish Jews, the Jews from Kurdistan continued to speak Aramaic. Um, and when they came to Israel, uh, because they were thrown out um, after the establishment of Israel, they came to Israel and um, uh, among themselves continued to speak Aramaic. And my uh, fellow student by the name of Yona Sabar, S-A-B-A-R, who became a professor at UCLA and has written about uh, his dissertation was on um, uh, the, um, this Aramaic uh, that he heard from his family. <clears throat> um, he was born in Kurdistan and uh, came to Israel. And um, I remember he um, told us some terrible stories about how the Kurdish Jews were mistreated in Israel. Uh, I remember um, my first visit in 1957 to Jerusalem when I lived there at the Hebrew University. Uh, if you had a big package that you had to pick up at the post office, you, you went uh, um, to a side street Street off of Rehov Yafo, the major street in Jerusalem. And there were a bunch of men sitting there. Um, and um, you could ask one of them to carry your package. It was kind of the UPS um, uh, delivery service. And they would carry big boxes on their backs. And um, and that was their, the way they made a living. And they were all Kurdish Jews. <laughs> um, and um, continued the um, Aramaic uh, um, speaking. Now, of course, their children forget it. Um, and I'm sure they don't speak uh, Aramaic. Um, um, but... Um, um, the, um, there are uh, two, um, two or three, there were three um, uh, different Christian um, uh, sects that, um, that um, read and, uh, and, and some of them still do read their, the scripture in what is called the Peshitta, P-E-S-H-I-T-T-A, uh, which is the Syriac translation of the Bible. Um, uh, there are um, three different vocalization systems in Syriac because uh, each of the Christian sects had their own vocalization system. Um, what most people don't know is that the vocalization system that we use in Hebrew is only one of three. The other two are Babylonian and Palestinian. The one we use is known as the Tiberian. And that became the standard, and that's what we use. But, uh, for instance, the Yemenites had texts that were vocalized in one of the other systems. Um, uh, 
In fact, um, uh, I had to learn the Babylonian system because uh, the uh, text that I was working on for my dissertation, I had um, uh, a number of manuscripts that were vocalized in the Babylonian system and not in uh, the system that we know um, uh, with the dots and the dashes underneath uh, and above. It's only one of three systems that developed at the end of the first millennium of the common era. Before that, there was no system to indicate vowels in Hebrew. There, uh, Hebrew developed that system only quite late. Um, um, uh, the um, other la uh, Semitic languages uh, developed uh, vocalization systems earlier. The vocalization was something that you learned just by hearing. Um, and in fact, um, there is um, a, a book, which I regrettably have never seen, but I read about it. It it's, uh, comes from the time when these systems were developed between about the seventh and ninth century of the common era. The book is called Achla V'Ochla. Achla V'Ochla. Um, you know that um, uh, the, the kamatz underneath sometimes is pronounced aw, like kod shecha. Not kad shecha, but kod shecha. It's the same sound as uh, the same symbol, the kamatz, whether it's ah or aw, if you are pronouncing it like the Sephardic the Israeli pronunciation. Some of us are old enough to have learned to read Hebrew in the Ashkenazic pronunciation, where this was always awe. You said Shabos. The taf without the dot was S. You didn't pronounce without the dot as T. So it was Shabos or Sukos. It wasn't Sukkot, it was Sukkos, and it was Shabbos, and, uh, and so forth. So we pronounced Ashkenazic, but um, the Achla Ochla was written to list all of the um, uh, words like achla ochla that are pointed the same way. They're all, both of them have an aleph, kaf, lam, and he. Under the aleph is a kamatz. Under the lamad is a kamatz. Achla means she ate. Ochla means her food. They're pronounced differently, but written the same. And so this book lists all of these uh, words where the, the vocalization is the same, but the pronunciation is different. Why is this? Well, when the Tiberian system was developed, it was developed in, to, to match the way Hebrew was pronounced in Tiberius. That's the Palestinian pronunciation, which became the pronunciation in Italy and those Jews in Italy who moved up to Germany became the Ashkenazic Jews. And the vocalization system of the Tiberian system was the system that made sense for Ashkenazic pronunciation. The, the Babylonians pronounced differently and they had a different vocalization system that 
represented the way they pronounced. We're now using the Ashkenazic system to pronounce it like Sephardic because Babylonian pronunciation went through North Africa to Spain under the Muslims. So the pronunciation of Sephardic, which became the basis with a minor changes to the way Israeli Hebrew is pronounced, is represented by a different system. We're using the Ashkenazic vowel system, pronouncing it like Sephardim. And that's why we have these problems, knowing that this kamatz can sometimes be pronounced off. Um, in many texts now, including the, the Lev Shalem, um, prayer books that the conservative movement is now using, we have uh, put in for the kamatz katan, which is pronounced aw, it's longer. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a little different from the normal one that is pronounced ah. So we have modified the, the, um, the, the, um, the kamatz to help people know when it should be all and not ah. Too much. I'm sorry. I I don't get much chance to use this uh, knowledge which uh, which I gained in uh, in in uh, graduate school. I I don't get a chance very often to uh, to use it. So I, I'm sorry. I. I probably uh, gave you, uh, what's it called? TMI, too much information. No, it was great, thank you. Yeah. It was great, because <laughs> we don't get this anywhere else, so. No, no, you, uh, I'm afraid you, you wouldn't get it very many places, that's true. Uh, 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 many years ago, uh, a dear a friend who is no longer with us, uh, said to me, why are you studying all this stuff? What are you going to do with it? You'll never be able to use it. All you can do is teach. <laughs> you, you're learning dead languages. <laughs> what, what are you doing learning dead languages? Uh, um, he was right. <laughs> okay, let's just finish this Mishnah and then we'll uh, stop. No one. You're here. Your class was canceled. Um, let's, if we can, I'd like to finish this Mishnah, um, uh, uh, just quickly, um, uh, the Mishnah continues in a case, in this case, where the woman mistakenly remarries, um, it continues to say, if she is a the daughter of an Israelite, not of a priest or a Levite, she cannot marry a Kohen. And if she is the daughter of a Levite, she can no longer enjoy the Maaser, which Levites and their families get. And if she is a daughter of a Kohen, she can no longer enjoy the Truma, which the Kohen's family normally can enjoy. Ein yorshim shel zeh, ve yorshim shel zeh, yorshim et ketubata. <clears throat> Neither of the men's um, uh, inheritance can um, 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 gain the benefit of the ketubah. And if uh, both of the men die, both bro brothers of both of them have to do chalitza. Um, uh, uh, um, where am I? Okay. 
they have to do chalitza. Uh, um, we, after all, we are in Masechet Yevamot. Uh, Rabbi Yossi disagrees, as does Rabbi Elazar, and does Rabbi Shimon. Um, and uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it at that. Um, next week, um, at, um, I will not be able to meet the class. Uh, Jean has a, an appointment, and uh, I have to be there with her. And the following week is Thanksgiving. So you have a two-week break, um, um, which uh, you're entitled to. Um, so we will meet again in December. Um, and um, I will be sure to inform uh, Nelson and uh, my, my cousin's son, Steve, um, and um, Elliot. And um, um, we miss Nelson and Elliot. I hope they're both well. And I'm delighted to see you all and uh, wish you uh, well and see you in December, Emir Sasha. Take care.